Well, what do you think? Should we start? Okay, then. Okay, I'm going to say it really loud. Good morning. Good morning. Find a seat if you can, and um, but don't sit in it because we're going to ask if you're able to stand and sing with us. Our first song is Behold Our God. Let's get ready to praise our Lord and Savior. Who has held the ocean in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him.
Jesus says, Come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for my, my yoke is light, is easy, a burden is light. And we come to worship a God who is gracious, who doesn't lord over us like a cruel tyrant, but who gives an easy burden and grace to carry it. I want to welcome you today to First Baptist Church. My name is Nat Erickson. I'm the pastor, and we are worshiping this gracious God this morning as we gather together. I want to remind you on the outside edges of the aisles, there's a little red book. If you can grab that, write your name down in it and pass it in. That's how we keep track of who's here, as well as if you have a prayer request or, or concerns, you can send those in to the office that way. We also have offering plates scattered around the sanctuary. We don't have an offering time. If you are, are ready and, and able to worship and giving today, you can leave, a, leave an offering there, as well as there's a way to set up online giving if that's more of your style. Tonight, we will begin our 7 p.m. summer Bible study time rather than 6 p.m., so our, our Sunday evening Bible study will be at 7 tonight, um, enjoying the sun when we have it this time of year. Thursday, we'll have our board meeting, so those of you on the boards, you can remember that. <coughs> Following the service next Sunday, we're going to have a time gathered in fellowship with ice cream. So that ice cream fellowship, plan to stay for that um, whether you eat ice cream or not, plan to stay for the fellowship. We started this week our summer adventure program, Fun in the Sun. Okay. Anyone complete anything this week? Okay, we, we got one. Oh, got another here. What would you do, Karen? Karen? Great. So we've got a, a rainbow. Been keeping an eye out, but I haven't seen the rainbow yet. Missed that one. We read a, a missionary biography together with the kids last night. I want to keep reminding people of that happening, fun in the sun. Keep, keep thinking of ways you can go out and think about how the sun, Jesus, is with us, even in this sunny time of year. Um, trustees... If you can gather briefly in the office following the church service for a quick meeting, that would be great. And I think that's all today. I um, want to just go ahead. I didn't give us a special question to discuss this week. So we can just have a generic go around and, and greet one another and yeah, say hi. See how your week has been. I'm going to spend a couple minutes greeting one another.
please remain standing as we sing our entrance hymn, number 79 in the hymnal. To God be the glory. remain standing for the blessing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are glorious. We praise you for giving us grace. We ask that we might learn to live in grace, that we might bless one another with grace instead of demanding performance from ourselves or from each other. Remind us this day that in your eyes we have a simple identity, loved ones. Help us to see that when we look upon one another as we fellowship, minister, and worship, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. From whom all blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
be seated. Our first scripture reading today comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 90. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Our offertory prayer for today. Father God, we are grateful to you for what we have. Though we may not have all that we wish, or we may have more than we ever dreamed, bless our hearts with contentment and guard us from the desire to seem great in the eyes, in others' eyes based on what we do with our finances. Instead, may we be great in your eyes through joyful and wise use of what you have blessed us with. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our final scripture for today comes from Matthew 11, 25 to 30. And that one you can find in the Pew Bibles on page 1,513. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. We had gone to watch a movie in the theater not too long ago, and there were previews. Boy, I remember these things. They played before the movie. It's an exciting taste of what's to come in the future. The, uh, the notes in the bulletin, for those of you who are a close note follower, are a preview for next week. We'll have a different one this week. But that, that'll be, it's, it's your taste of, of what is to come. But it's on the right general track. We're, we're talking about that we value our volunteers as ministry. That is our ministry. Volunteers don't exist to do ministry. We value them as ministry. So I want you to think about something. What do you call a church with no bell? A church. What do you call a church that has seats, not pews? A church. What do you call a church that doesn't do a Wednesday night Bible study? A church. What do you call a church that has a choir? A church. 
What do you call one that has no music? A church. What do you call a church that has no nursery? A church. What do you call a church that doesn't even have a building? You, you call it a church. There's a core reality, which is the church. It's, it's God's people gathered together. Now, of course, each one of those situations has implications for the future and health and, and well-being of that particular church, but, but it's still a church. And I want you to appreciate something. Virtually everything that happens on Sunday mornings, on other times, that virtually everything that you associate with this church is done by volunteers. Right? It is. All the way down to the budget that we have is voluntarily donated. Today we have one particular family is gone and so the normal music leading is a little different and we recognize that. Um, the music, the teaching, almost everything that you associate with a normal church life is done by volunteers here. Okay? That's good. It's good and, and it's right, but it, it brings some particular difficulties in the life of a church. There's lots of, of tools we use to minister, lots of ways, lots of programs, lots of events, lots of types of music. Lot, we use these to minister. They're tools. They're ways to do ministry. There's a, a tendency that we have to turn possible ministry tools into must ministry tools, must-dos. Can-dos become must-dos in our minds. And volunteers have a particular difficulty when we start turning can-dos into must-dos. As they get caught in the crossfire, um, in whatever way you're sharing your times, your talents, or your treasures, when can-dos become must-dos, volunteers get a lot of pressure put on them. And, and there's a few reasons. One, we live in a guilt culture. So if you're not doing something that you could, you feel guilty because you've been trained to do that. And other people gladly help you to feel guilty. Right? We're, we're usually pretty good at that. We also live in an achievement culture. We define our value and our worth by what we do as individuals and as a church. So if we've got a tool, it is going to be the best doggone tool possible so we show that we're valuable. If you have a skill, how am I valuable to this church? Well, I'll use that skill. So we have achievement culture. And then, then there's one that's really peculiar that we wrestle with. It's a little more theological and a little more abstract, but, but, but deep. Most Christians wrestle with God's grace actually being a free gift he gives to us. We desperately want to earn it. We desperately want to prove to God some way that we're valuable and that we were worth it. That Jesus came because we're important and we're worth it and here's how we're going to prove it. We're going to work harder, try harder, do more. And so we pile these on together, our achievement culture, our guilt culture, and our craving to, to show God that we're significant and important by what we do, and that puts a heavy burden on volunteers. All the way from giving money to those who are deeply involved in teaching and everywhere in between, it puts a heavy burden. To keep those tools, those can-dos, those ministries going in as best as they can be to show God that we matter, to show that we're significant. And these are, we wrestle with this, these sort of desires that mix together. And especially, we think back over the history of this church, and, and many of you have been here for a long time and have seen it ebb and flow over the years and have seen that, you know, there's less people here than there were 20 years ago. There's less things going on than there were 20 years ago. 
are we failing? What's going wrong? And, the, and these are questions that pile on top. Did the volunteers mess up and is it their fault? These are the sorts of questions that we sometimes articulate but very often feel. Jesus, in that passage we read, talks about how his yoke is light. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, it's a really interesting image because a yoke, of course, is an implement for work. And what he's referring to is not the, the traditional, like, ox, two oxen yoked together, but a yoke that a person would carry. So you use it to carry heavy buckets, you know, over your shoulders. The same idea, you know, a bucket on each side. You've probably seen one. Carrying heavy buckets is hard. Carrying heavy buckets with a yoke is easier. So you use the yoke. It's an implement for work. That's its purpose. So Jesus is saying at one and the same hand, at both hands at the same time, saying, my yoke is easier. Come to me when you're weary, and I have work for you to do. It's not, a, it's not a no work deal, but I have a lighter work. And especially there, what he's referring to are these religious leaders of the day who were so zealous to make sure that God's commands were never violated that they added and added and added on top of them. They turned more and more can-dos into must-dos. And Jesus comes and says, no, you, you don't actually need to do those can-dos. I will give you a lighter yoke. Appreciate the yoke that God has given you. Don't make it heavier for yourself. You don't need to do that. We're talking, thinking today about God's grace and our culture of volunteering and the way that we expect volunteers to work and do things. And what I want to press us towards, whether it's new or whether just push us further down the line, is to think that, that volunteers are our ministry. They're, they're, they don't exist to do ministry. So we are gracious with one another rather than demanding from one another. And I want to try to unpack this in, in sort of three levels, like we've done as we've worked through our other core values. So the first one, first one I want to talk about splitting wood. How much wood could this mall split? Not the greatest mall in the world, but it's perfectly capable. Handles in good shape, bits in good shape. How much could it split? It depends on who's using it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the mall by itself may be a perfectly fine mall, but without someone using it, it just sits there. It hasn't split any wood at least as long as we've been here. It hangs in the garage wall. It only splits as much as, you, as much as you split with it. See, when we think about volunteers and programs and events at church, the events, the programs, they're tools. They're like a mall. It's good to have good tools. We should do as much as we can to have good tools. But, but good tools by themselves do nothing without people who use them. And the people who use them are, are like our volunteers. Now, if you're out splitting wood and, and you're watching someone split and, and they, there's a funny metal sound and the mall goes flying one way and they yell out in pain, do you run over to check that the mall's okay or do you run over to check that the person is okay? <laughs> there we go, yeah. So, hopefully, you're more concerned that the person is okay. And then you go check the mall. Um, but but we can often end up in church life being so concerned that our, that our tools are okay that we run to the mall and make sure that's okay and forget about the person who was using it and who is now hurting. Who 
who, who is serving the church in ways that you value and when did you encourage them last? People wear themselves out trying to use the tools of the church. When have you encouraged them last? Or are you just expecting that they'll split more wood and just keep at it? Valuing our volunteers is like is being concerned that our programs are good and are, are there and, and that we have the right tools and that the tools are in good shape. But more than that, it's realizing the wood doesn't get split without someone using the tool. So we're making sure they're in good shape. We're making sure they're encouraged and blessed. So first level, splitting wood. Second level, and thinking about how volunteers are our ministry. They don't exist to do ministry. Think about the Arabian Desert. Okay, I'm going to put up this picture here. You may be familiar with the movie Hidalgo from the early 2000s. Oh, it's kind of washed out, sorry. Um, Hidalgo, a movie so loosely based in historical events that to call it historical is laughable, but it's a good movie. Um, and the premise is it's this huge, long race through the Arabian desert, and the guy from out west brings his horse, Hidalgo, and wins the race in the desert against all these Arabian horses. That's a great movie. To win the race, what do you need to do? Just get to the end before anyone else. In a, in a race mentality, it's, it's your, to your advantage for the other horses to get lost, to die, to quit along the way. In fact, that helps you win. You just try to get there faster and lose whatever you have to, sacrifice whatever you have to. That's how you win races. Okay? That's one way to cross the Arabian Desert. A very different mindset for crossing the Arabian Desert is a trade caravan. A group of people get together with their camels, pack them up, and cross the desert together. For a trade caravan to be successful, everyone needs to make it, not just one. You don't sacrifice everything across the way. You don't care who falls and just say, oh, leave them. For the trade caravan to work, everyone's got to make it. Too often, in church, we end up more of the Hidalgo race across the desert, sacrifice whatever to get to our goal, rather than the trade caravan approach, where we look out for one another, take care of one another. Oh, you're weak and you're struggling right now. How can we help you? We look at our volunteers like they're in a race that they need to win, work harder, run faster, instead of how can we come up and support you? How can we bless you? So em embrace this caravan mentality for the people around us, the ministries that happen in the church, in the community, wherever it be, how are we blessing one another, helping one another, rather than demanding from one another? Volunteers are our ministry. They don't exist to do ministry. We, we see first with the mall and splitting wood, having good tools is great, but the people need to be there to use them. The second picture is, it doesn't matter how fast you can get across the desert if the whole caravan doesn't come together. It's a failed work. So how do we take care of one another? I'm going to give you one last picture to think about how volunteers are our ministry. World War I is famous for one thing in particular, trench warfare. Overly optimistic leaders and military people said, we'll kick the enemy's butt real quick and win this 
war and instead you end up with thousands of miles of trenches dug in the ground where you're counting how many deaths does it take to get a few more feet of territory. It was an awful, awful situation. Um, there's a, a great movie, Kirk Douglas, Stanley Kubrick movie, Paths of Glory, about loosely based in history, closer to history than Hidalgo is, but, but still loosely based in history, about something that, that happened in all of the armies in World War I. People were executed for cowardice. Their cowardice being, we're not going to run over the top of that trench to get mowed down by a machine gun. Why? What are we going to gain by it? A couple feet of dirt? Um, but no, the, the military machine said, those few feet of dirt are worth your life, so get over the top or, or we'll take you out from behind. Right, trench warfare was an awful thing. But the, the trench warfare mentality hangs around with us even if trench warfare has long passed. Where we've decided on a goal and, and dug on it, no matter how many waves we have to send over the top, no matter how many times they get mowed down, no matter how many times it fails, we'll go at it again. And, and the irony is that very often the volunteers who are willing to go over the top are very different than the people saying go. And the generals are sitting in the back saying, you go, and the volunteers are going over and being beaten down again and again. And we burn ourselves out, we wear out, we give up, we walk away, or we become disgruntled, we withdraw, we, we continue on in the battle because it must be done and no one else is doing it. So though I've long lost joy in this service, I'll carry it on because it's been said it needs to happen. Are volunteers our ministry or do they exist to do ministry? Because if they exist just to do ministry, then by all means, send them up over the top. It'll be glorious. There are few causes. In fact, there is no cause more glorious than serving the kingdom of God. So go over the top and go again and go again. But maybe the path to glory isn't to see how many of us can get mowed down in the effort along the way. Maybe the path to glory asks us to think a little bit differently about how we relate to one another. We don't need to demand that one another burns out because we've turned a can into a must. Maybe we can reassess the musts we've decided on. Say maybe at this point in the life of the church, maybe something that made sense 10 years ago doesn't make sense anymore. And instead of throwing people at it, we'll say, all right, we'll let that fall. Maybe it'll come back, maybe it won't. But are we more concerned that it happens or are we more concerned that the people are filled up by God's grace, are filled up by God's love and are cared for by one another? Going back to that picture of the yoke that Jesus uses, we are in fact called to ministry. We are in fact called to work. The Apostle Paul uses a beautiful turn of phrase as he's speaking about what he does. He says, the love of Christ compels us. Not the expectations of other people around compel me. Not social pressures compel me. Not my guilty conscience compels me to keep doing this. No, the love of Christ compels me. Is what we're doing and what we're asking others to do because Christ's love is compelling us? 
or because our own expectations, our own best thoughts, our own ideas are demanding it. It's, it's a thing for us to, uh, to wrestle with. Most churches have a long trail of casualties along the way where it was decided the goal is more important than the people who we're using. And they fall away, leave disgruntled, or stay disgruntled. And neither of those are great. Having great tools is good. Having people to use them is better. Having the fastest horse is great, but it really doesn't help the caravan that needs to stay together. And you know, winning those couple other feet of dirt may be glorious, but if the cost is another person burning out and falling along the wayside, then it's probably not actually what God wants us to be doing right now. Churches minister. A healthy church blesses the people in it and the community that it's in, and that requires work and that requires effort. But are we being compelled by the love of Christ, or are we compelling one another with so many other motives to make sure that our, our can gets done whatever the cost may be. Can we, as a people of God, step further and further into the direction of saying, our volunteers are our ministry that we exist to bless, to give grace to, to give encouragement to, rather than saying the ministry is the point and whatever suffering needs to happen by our volunteers, that's just more glory to God. So out of all of the pictures that were given of God in Scripture, one is, is notably lacking. God the slave driver. It's not there. He does, in fact, use the picture that his people are slaves, Okay, that picture is there, but, but God the slave driver is not a picture used in Scripture. Jesus didn't come to call a people so that he could crush them and say, work harder, give up more, try more, you're not good enough, you'll never be good enough, but work harder anyways. That's not what he came for. Unfortunately, we contend in those directions in the way we treat one another, though. The love of Christ compels us to one another's good and to ministry. Volunteers are our ministry. May God's grace bring us there we pray. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, you have given labor for us to do. You have given fields that are ripe unto harvest. You have given opportunities. You have given us skills, abilities, desires, and these are all beautiful things. And often, we turn our skills and abilities into things we demand from one another, and often we turn opportunities into demands. And, and we count the cost in bodies dropped along the way, in hearts that are turned off, and in lives that are burnt out on the ends. Instead of counting the cost and drinking deep in grace, giving grace and love richly to one another, Lord, would we grow wherever we are along the way, of being blessings towards one another, of giving encouragement and help rather than more demands weighed upon guilty consciences, weighed upon people who are wrestling with your grace on their own. May this body be a family in the deepest sense. 
Lord, because as, as heartless as the generals were sending the men up over the trenches, they didn't send their own kids up over. They, they took care of them. And we know that the families, when they work right, take care of one another. Lord, would we be concerned about taking care of one another so that we can minister from places where our hearts are full of love and joy and grace rather than shame and compulsion and disgruntlement. May this people be blessed. By you we pray in your name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our hymn of response. It's number 405 in your hymnal. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Empty that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand, with no power but as thou givest graciously with each command channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst use us every day and every Witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin. Thou who bought me to possess me, in thy fullness, Lord, come in. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. You may be seated. <clears throat> 